understanding with the future of much more significant um, weather. Um, and to give you an idea of, of what form this might take, I think when people hear of, of um, rising um, sea levels, they think, oh dear, rising sea levels. You know, what does that mean? Cities will be flooded. Well, this is one particular entry to the, the competition that was quite brilliant. This is a uh, um, urban designer in um, Denmark, uh, Luke uh, Brojtix, and uh, he was putting forward a uh, proposal for how um, New York City and surrounds could make its coastline more resilient to um, uh, storm surges over time with a, a series of um, uh, infill pro projects outside, I don't have a pointer here, but infill projects of land, uh, uh, land reclamation of, of dikes, of um, landfill based on future development that was strategically set up to not only um, reduce storm surges, but actually increase the quality of the local marine ecology in the area. So again, killing a few birds with one stone. Very thoughtful idea. So start to think about what's going to be happening with the impacts of climate change on the cities you plan in ways that can not only help defend or prepare those cities for those impacts, but also have beneficial consequences in the process. Um, so, what can we do? Well, um, this is us, and as I was as I was uh, driving home yesterday, um, I was thinking about this picture that Mark took of us, and at the very same time you were doing this. Which is very positive. Think about it. Look at all those faces. They're filled with um, interest. Um, there are, there's a lot of intense discussion going on. There's curiosity. People are designing. They're thinking of the future. There's a lot of very positive energy in that, in that room. There was yesterday. A lot of energy. There are a few people that look a little bit bored. I saw one person over there look quite bored. But um, uh, he may have been in pensive thought. You can't tell sometimes. Um, but here's another picture of what was happening at the same time you were doing this. You know where that is, right? It's Egypt, just outside Tahir Square. And the reason that's happening is not because Mubarak's a bad leader, irrespective of whether he is or not. It's because that culture, that country, did not, at some point, years before, take seriously, and uh, uh, granted, this is a huge simplification, but it wasn't acknowledging the kind of issues that right now you're thinking about for the future. It did not understand that in 10, 15, 20 years, all of those kids that were two years old, all of those boys that were two years old would be men of the age of 16 to 25, um, that they would not have jobs because the economic prospects weren't getting any better. And what do men of that age without jobs do? And that energy scarcity might be happening. And when energy scarcity starts to push up food costs significantly in a very short period of time, as Homer Dixon showed you the, the pictures of the, the fires in Russia and the, and the uh, terrible grain year that the whole world had, that's what's driving the riots across the Middle East. So what we were doing yesterday, I think these two pictures together are very good, um, are a very good, oh, hold on, sorry, are a very good indication of why you're doing what you're doing and why it's so important. Because it's not just about whether or not Leaf's um, developer boss thinks he's doing a good job or whether or not current planning folks at the local municipality are going to approve your plan. It's because the impact you're going to have can be um, in the quantum of people's lives, significant impact on people's lives in the future, given the kind of significant changes that we're going to be seeing over the next 20 to 50 years. So that's really why you should care about this stuff. And this slide, you must have seen this 
and heard this a hundred times, and it's almost gotten the point of being trite. But I think in this context, it's very, very true. You folks are the people that will have a significant impact on how our societies um, live and potentially prosper in the future. So I think it's incumbent upon you and, and me and us to take it seriously. So what are the five things that you could do, you could start to do tomorrow um, if you want to make a difference? Um, the first thing I think you could do is go read these three books. Give yourself the context um, of what the underpinnings of resilience are, why you should care about resilience. Homer Dixon's book is a brilliant book. Um, he's a great speaker, but his book is, is, is really wonderful because it sets up the underpinnings, the understandings for why these bigger picture socioeconomic um, and environmental issues are going to interconnect in the future and why it's important you, for you to understand. Um, Climate Wars by Gwen Dyer is a book that, unlike most books about climate change, it's arresting. It's a page-turning book, by the way. And Gwen Dyer, if, if you don't know him as an author, writes about military history and military strategy. And so he approached this book from, well, let's not talk about whether or not you know, water is going to rise two or three feet and, and inundate cities. Let's talk about the geopolitical um, implications of climate change and what kind of um, forces those will create in our world. And I think one of the geopolitical uh, forces you saw in Tahir Square. And then um, Thomas Homer Dixon mentioned uh, Jeff Rubin yesterday, why your world is about to get a whole lot smaller. It's basically the economic impacts on us um, as a result of energy scarcity. So those are three books, if you do nothing else and take nothing else away from what I've said, are worth reading. Um, and the next thing, pay attention to energy flows in the cities and communities you plan. Be very aware of what you're doing when you're planning in terms of its consequences for either causing energy to be used or um, causing energy to be retained. Uh, obviously suburban planning is a huge waster of energy um, for many reasons. Uh, mixed use, higher density is a conserver of energy. Uh, we've talked about it, but again, start to think in terms of energy flows. Um, three, learn how to plan and design for mixed use, high density. It's one thing to talk about mixed use, high density, but start to actually understand what mixed use buildings are. Um, I'm an architect um, and an urban designer, so I think about planning in terms of its physical manifestations as opposed to very abstractly as being plans and zones and, and, and uses and so forth. I think about it as a physical reality. I think as planners, you should make yourself aware of the physical reality of what buildings and public spaces are and how they work um, and how mixed use and high density it has a hugely positive impact on the vitality of the community, but also will add to its resilience. And I think you want to try and learn how to plan and design for relocalization. It's a it's one of those things that hasn't been talked about. It's just not on the radar for a lot of people. There's a local food movement in the city, in most cities right now. Um, they tend to be sort of fringe entities, activities, but a lot of these things won't actually happen and they won't be taken seriously until such time as the kind of stress on our on our economies, on our culture, on our cities, start to intensify to a point where people say, what the heck is going on? We've got to find an answer to this. And, and I, I was listening to this discussion, and that all of the discussion of the planners here um, was a discussion of, well, will they allow this? The neighbors didn't want that. You know, this wasn't moving as fast. The Ontario government had a good plan, but the, the planners were being too detailed. It was sort of status quo, an environment of safety, of wealth, of plenty, of things being just okay, thank you very much, and whether or not a developer had made a little extra money or less, that was probably the extent of the problem. But when some of these, um, the, the three factors we talked about, population, aging demographic right now in Canada, um, when energy scarcity and climate change all start to interact with one another, you can bet that there are going to be stresses 